So I want to talk about turtle and people, turtle and islanders, and turtle and turtle shell. But I want to start by talking about turtle. Marine turtles are cold-blooded reptiles, slow moving on land, but in the water they glide effortlessly. Using their forelimbs for thrust and rear limbs as a rudder, they navigate seasonal winds and crisscrossing currents to take themselves thousands of kilometres across oceans. Like their distant cousin, the crocodile, they move between the land and the water. But unlike the crocodile, their only time on land is generally restricted to the sandy beaches where the female turtles go to lay their eggs. Invariably, it is on these beaches, on the beaches where they first entered the ocean as hatchlings, that the mature females return to lumber up the beach and excavate a nesting pit to lay their clutch of eggs. In their only vaguely parental gesture, they brush sand over the newly laid eggs <coughs> before trudging back to the sea. For the next two to three months, the females stay in nearby shallow waters, feeding, mating, and returning every two or so weeks to lay further clutches. Under the right conditions, the eggs hatch. And at the peril of predators from sky and sea, dozens of tiny hatchlings scuttle into the water and head into the open ocean. There they will spend what is known as the lost years, 10 to 20 years foraging and growing in the open ocean before returning to coastal zones to feed, mate, nest, and continue the cycle that has taken place for millennia. In Torres Strait, due to seasonal winds and the ocean currents that surge through this narrow passage, marine turtles and islanders have been a part of each other's existence for a very long time. Of the seven identified species of sea turtle in the world, six are known to either breed or migrate through the Torres Strait, and islanders chart their seasonal movements. As the southeast trade winds, known to islanders as Sager, transition to the doldrums or Nagai, the mature turtles return to the region to mate. By the early northwest monsoons, or Kuki, hundreds of hatchlings take to the ocean. The relationship of, that islanders have with marine turtles can also be measured through the archaeological evidence which has dated islanders subsistence and ceremonial use of turtle to 7,000 years before present. Islanders' own histories of deep time evidence social and cultural lives enriched by physical and spiritual relationships between islanders and turtles. Islanders are, like many islanders, or all islanders, are maritime people. And the sea, with all its temperaments and treasures, is interwoven into the subsistence and cultural fabric of islanders' lives. Turtles are an important thing. I, I want to resist saying resource because it, I don't know, brackets it off. But turtles are an important thing to islanders. And islanders hunted two marine species extensively. Green turtle, Chelonia medas, and the hawksbill, uh, Eric Moklis imbricata. My Latin is not very good. The longevity of islander use of turtle facilitated the development of a rich bank of knowledge on turtle and turtle ecology. And particular taxonomies exist in the two languages of the region. The green turtle is Nam in the eastern language of Miriam Mir, and Waru in the western island language of Kala Lavaya. In the eastern islands, the Hawksbill turtle was generally called shell turtle and was distinguished by its size and quality of its shell. The large hawk's bills called Olai, the small baug. The strongest shell, Karar, the inferior kasol. In the 70s, it was recorded that of all marine fauna, it was turtle and dugong that islanders described with the utmost precision. Western islanders distinguished between 13 varieties of green turtle based on size, sex, age, color, habitat, agility, appearance, and taste of the animal's fat. Islanders selected kapuwaru, good turtle, over gatawaru, dry turtle. Gatawaru, they say, are sedentary. They stay cl too close to the reef. And they eat a type of algae that makes their fat black and unpalatable. Green turtle, the favored, um, the favored turtle for eating, is often, oh sorry, good turtle, which is a green turtle, 
is often female and fat. And they are usually in this condition during the mating season, known throughout the Torres Strait as Sulal. The Sulal season generally runs from September through to October. During this time, turtles are plentiful. Hunting is made simpler as along with their need to surface to take in oxygen, their mating habits involve many hours of coupling, thus rendering them utterly oblivious to the threat of hunters. For islanders, the green turtle was and continues to be an important source of protein. Its meat, fat, blood, and the oil made from its fat was used extensively. Aside from meat, and the focus of my presentation today really, turtle was also material for islanders. And islanders worked with the shell predominantly of the hawksbill turtle to produce some of the most sophisticated sculptural works in turtle shell of any culture. Which brings me to the marks that I want to talk about. But some background, so just some general stuff on total shell. The composite masks of animal forms, often surmounted by a human face, although there isn't one on this mask, are called kra in Western Island language and are associated with the Western and the Central Islands of the Torres Strait. The masks were constructed from the panels or scoops of turtle shell, which is a semi-transparent keratin-based material attached to the bony dome-shaped carapace of the turtle. Scoops can be removed from the carapace by either placing the carapace in hot water or by burying the carapace in sand for a week or more. Scoots also fall off the carapace of dead turtles and are found in areas where turtles were butchered or where their remains were stored or buried. Pliable on heating, the scoots are pressed, are shaped, sorry, by pressing and moulding it with a hot stone. Holes are made along the edges so the panels could be held together with natural fibre stone. <coughs> And while we might look to archaeology to date the general use of turtle in the region, we can only turn to island accounts for the origin of the ma these masks themselves. In the late 1890s, Kuduma of Nagir, and if I go, so, <coughs> so here is Nagir, here is Mabil, where this mask is from. So in the late 1890s, Kuduma, Kuduma of Nagi in the central Torres Strait recounted the following. Naga of Nagi knew how to make the kra, or masks, in the form of animals. He instructed the men in singing and dancing, and in everything related to the quad, or the men's ceremonial ground. Wayet of Mabyo came to Nagi to learn how to beat the drum, and Naga taught him. Then Wayet stole a famous mask. After this, Naga gave a mask to the men of Tudu, another to those of Warber, a third to Moa, and he kept one mask in Nagi. Naga gave clamshells to all the islands, Murulag, Warber, Tudu, Yaru, Moa, Bariu, Mabyog, Masig, Aurin, so that the men on these islands might in future make their own masks. But Naga was very angry because Wyatt had stole his mask. From Kuduma's account, we learn not only the potential origin of the masks in Nagir in the central Torres Strait, but also about the diffusion of mask-making practices across the region. When Nagar lived and began this tradition is impossible to determine. However, we do know that the first recorded European sighting of turtle shell masks predates James Cook's 1770 claim of the eastern part of the Australian continent by almost, by almost 170 years. In 1606, Luis Valles de Torres became the first known European to navigate a passage through the region. A member of his party, a Spanish captain de Prado, uh, de Prado wrote, in the morning we went ashore to the village which was abandoned and we found a quantity of turtle and a great quality, of great quality valued by the East Indians and a quantity of masks made of the said turtle, very well finished, and a fish called albacore, or tuna, imitated so naturally that it seemed to be the very thing, and a half man, half fish of a yard and a half long, also made as a good sculptor might have finished it. 
The island identified by De Prado in this passage is known to islanders as Zege. Um, and it's not marked on here, but it's this island here. So, 1606, these masks are seen. From the mid to the late 19th century, though, as commerce and Christianity moved into the region, many of the masks were traded or taken, and now they're held in museums around the world. I, today, am talking about, oh, I'm talking today about this mask. This turtle shell mask was collected from Mabyog Island in the Torres Strait sometime in the 1880s. Masks, of masks such as these, there are about 80 to 90 that still exist. And they are important historical and cultural object, objects for islanders. They hold the histories of island ceremonies and cultural practices and are imbued with a multifaceted regime of meaning tied to their making and their use. Importantly, practice relate, practices related to their use recognise the spiritual power of the living turtle and of the objects made of turtle shell. The mask measures about 122 centimetres in length and was taken from Mabyog in the mid-1880s by the Reverend Samuel McFarlane of the London Missionary Society. Fostering Christian faith was McFarlane's primary activity in the region. And his reports to the LMS headquarters in the UK reveal almost nothing about his proclivity for collecting. However, his letters and transaction records reveal that over a period of about 12 years, he collected and sought recompense for a number of animal specimens and at least a dozen large turtle shell masks from Mabyog. And one of them in the British Museum is just over two metres long. It's unclear how he came to acquire the objects. Maybe he took them from their usual resting place in a quiet dark cave near the ceremonial grounds. Or perhaps in his role as missionary and saviour, he confiscated them from the people of Mabyog. Whatever his motives, his papers and journals are silent. This mask was acquired by the British Museum in 1886, and its purpose is not recorded in any of their documentation. The purpose of similar masks, that include a combination of animal figures and often a human face, have been described as being used in death or funeral ceremonies and spirit dances. The mask brings into spiritual form animals of the sky and sea, the kaigas, the shovel nose ray, a sharp toothed fish, and two smaller fish, the head of the womero, as a frigate bird. The mask is stunning in its construction and finish, and in gazing on it, we can only marvel at the vision and skill of its maker. And it was made to be worn and performed in. Imagine it being placed on the head of a wearer like a biker's helmet. His identity is not revealed to us as he looks out on us through the mouth of the fish. Biting down on a crossbar, he guides the direction and angle of the mask by moving his head. He has complete control, control over which view of the mask we see. When he tilts his head forward, we see the kaigas. As he turns to the side, the three fish are most obvious. When he turns his back to us, the birds are prominent. And on the back of the mask, we glimpse three human figures etched in line on the rear panel. I'll have a better slide of this. Yeah. As the dancer moves, the rattle of the shells and the dried goa seeds create percussive accompaniment. In his wearing of the mask, he brings the human and the animal together. Fleetingly and figuratively, human and animal become one. The mask is made primarily of wood and turtle shell. I just want to describe it now. It's embellished with feathers, seashells, goa nuts, and tufts of red and blue wool, which give us some idea of you know, the time it was made. the tufts of red wool where they stood. The animal forms of the shovel nose, sculptural representations of the two varieties of fish are made of turtle shell. 
the heads of the Womare or the frigate bird are made of wood. In its assemblage, the animals also face in different directions. The Kaiga sees above the large base fish and two top fish look ahead while the birds look behind. The Kaigas is also anatomically precise. It's presented in outline form in the manner it might be observed if we were to look down on it when we're standing in a boat or on the beach looking down on the water. Along the edge of the snout and the pectoral fins is an engraved band of wave-like patterning with white infill. Along the dorsal fin, in a line between the eyes and the dorsal fins, the denticles, the thorny teeth-like structures, are represented by 12 small cowrie shells, which is that image there. Their base is removed and they sit neatly along the dorsal surface. Looking down on the mask, Looking down on the mask, the kaigas obstructs the view of the sharp-toothed fish and the gills, while on either side of the kaigas are the profiles of the two whole fish, about 22 centimetres long and cut from a single piece of turtle shell. The fish, which I think are giant trevelli, are engraved to show their eyes, their nose, the nose, gills and fin markings. And finally, at the very back, the heads of the birds are carved from wood and the three human forms outlined in line. With their arms raised, they look wide-eyed at the world. The meaning of their posture and positioning on the mask is puzzling. One reading is that they bring together the human and the animal, even when, or perhaps especially when, the mask is not worn, when it's stored away between ceremonies. I guess the other thing with that is that islander histories include transformation as a common aspect of mythic times, when humans became animals. And this mask is perhaps one way this transformation is symbolised. I want to, I'm, I'm going to wrap up now. Sadly, for islanders, no 19th century turtle shell masks remain in the Torres Strait. Of the 80 or so, in existence, the majority of them, as I've said, are housed in international collections or overseas collections. Yet despite the fact that I've viewed and photographed for my research um, these objects far away from the Torres Strait, this does not make them any less potent in the eye of many islanders. Islanders today do not use turtle shell masks in any contemporary practices, but they are increasingly aware of the 19th century turtle shell material through exhibitions, the digital collections of institutions, and also the efforts that are being made by museum staff to find out more about the objects and their source communities. Um, and on top of that, the work of island artists and community leaders who've travelled to the UK and Europe to view many of these masks. And while many of the objects were collected as evidence of a dying culture, dying culture, and exhibited in museums around the world, as still and silent, or interpreted through the discourses of Western aesthetics and the primitive other, the power of the objects remains known, and I would say accessible, to islanders. Contemporary islander beliefs about the latent power of the turtle shell materials, to, in my mind, you know, this is an idea I'm developing, compress the time and space divide, and compel me to consider the masks and treat the masks as, as evidence of cultural endurance rather than objects of long dead cultural practices, which makes telling, researching, telling and writing this history both compelling but also challenging. As museums open their doors to the descendants and source communities, Arla's interest and engagement with this kind of material has steadily increased. Given the period turtle shell masks have been separated from cultural practices, we might ask whether they mean anything more to islanders now than they do to exhibition goers who have no cultural association with them. As I talk to islanders around the country and document the meaning of the 19th century material to islanders today, I'm constantly referred to the expansive creative work of artists like Alec Tapoti and Dennis Nola, um, and dancer choreographer Elmer Chris, who inspired the, by these materials continue, continue to create sprawling works of art or choreograph 
hauntingly evocative productions. So while these masks might sit in dark and silent space in museum collections around the world, for many islanders there is an unshakable belief that the power of the masks is sustained by the human-animal relationships that were forged in mythic times. That power remains intact and dormant and awaits activation by the right people in the right ceremony. 